The coronavirus has brought changes and anxiety into many lives. It's also brought questions. People are asking, why did God let this happen? Is this part of the Great Tribulation period? Well, I'm going to help answer some of those questions this week from the Scriptures as we take a look at what the Bible calls the beginning of sorrows. That's what's coming up next as Arkansas Live starts right now. <clears throat> you know, even my title has some kind of alertness, awareness to it, the beginning of sorrows. But I want you to know what the Bible says. I have been listening to all of the prognosticators and propheticals and speculators, everybody that's got a comment, and I am amazed. I shudder more at what they're explaining than, you know, the virus or the fear or whatever, because people sometimes, and I have this in my notes, they try to make a prophetic biblical point out of every civil commotion that takes place. And there have been some wrong information out there, not just about the virus, but scriptural response to it. So uh, I want to take this week, and I hope you'll join me every day because I've got a lot of material to cover, but I think it'll be worth your while. Let's start at Matthew 24. I keep going back to this, and as I was reading it again the other day, this part of this text just really illuminated to me, and I knew the Holy Spirit was going to give me more information. Matthew 24, beginning with verse 3, as Jesus sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, they, they asked him three questions. Tell us when these things shall be, the one, what he just told them, what shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? The last question, the end of the world, means the end of the age, the age of grace or the church age not the end of the world or the end of the earth, like we hear people talking about it, but the end of the age, this dispensation. When's, what's going to happen? When is the end of the age uh, going to take place? And Jesus answered them. And he said, take heed that no man deceive you. I'd highlight that, underline it, and nobody deceive you. Then he tells them what they're going to hear and see. You're going to hear of wars, rumors of wars, but see that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end of the age is not yet. The end of the church age, the end of the age of grace is not yet. Now notice when he says all these things must come to pass, he sometimes leaves that up to your understanding of the scriptures. And what I found out during this whole period, this virus period, the church, by and large, doesn't understand much of anything. They're probably more um, receptive to their denominational doctrine, uh, the carnal aspects, the human aspects, the medical aspects, uh, and they don't really know what the scriptures say. They don't really understand this. And that's why I'm, I'm teaching it. We are in what Jesus called the beginning of sorrows. What does that mean? If you'll stay tuned all week and you hear this, you'll be more knowledgeable than most Christians and you'll understand what's happening. And I'll expose some wrong theories, match them up with the Bible, See what they say. If a theory or a speculation or a doctrine can stand up with the scriptures, fine. But if it doesn't, throw it out. He said these things must come to pass. Um, and then he goes on and says, um, uh, many will come in my name saying, I'm Christ and will deceive many. And you'll hear of wars, rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. All these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Then he goes down and describes some of the things that are going to take place. Nation you'll, will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse 
places. All these that he just named are the beginning of sorrows. Now, let me explain that to you. Uh, you can look this up. You can follow it in your scriptures. But I, I want to read you some of my, uh, my notes. The beginning of sorrows is mentioned in Matthew 24, Mark 13. It's a period of time characterized by specific signs that the second coming of Christ is near. I'm going to share with you something the Royal Roberts said. I think this was probably 203, 204, might have been later. He had a vision, and the Lord really ministered to him concerning this statement. These are signs that specifically indicate that the second coming of Christ is near. These signs also cause an increase in pain and sorrow that the Bible likens to a woman as she goes through her pregnancy and is about to give birth, the beginning of sorrows. The analogy of a pregnant woman in the end of times is drawn from the Old Testament. Isaiah 13 describes the day of the Lord prior to a woman giving birth. She experiences painful contractions. The culmination of the sorrows are birth pangs. It's an easy way to remember it. The beginning of sorrows are birth pangs. Birth pangs that take place at delivery when the pain of childbirth is most intense. After that, there's the joy that the child is born. So if you can look past these birth pangs, look past the beginning of sorrows, then you know what's on the other side of these pains, these contractions. These are the words of Jesus, the beginning of sorrows. This is the beginning of the birth period. This is the time of contractions. But on the other side, after the birth takes place, there's going to be joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now, we want to examine this fully. Um, as with a woman that's about to give birth, uh, the time from the beginning of sorrows until Jesus' return, establishing his eternal kingdom, will be characterized by increased pain and sorrow. Now, listen very carefully to this culminating with the utter destruction when God judges the nations, not the church, when God judges the nations, the ungodly nations, not the Jewish nation, the ungodly nations, the heathen nations. And in doing so, he destroys the beast's antichrist system. Now, you have to know a little bit about the book of Revelation. You have to know a little bit about biblical prophecy to understand this. After the rapture of the church, the catching away of the church, which is the first part or first advent of Jesus' second coming. After the church is caught up to meet Jesus in the air, that's biblical. Then the great tribulation period is going to take place which means the Antichrist, the false prophet, the beast system will all be put in place. For seven years, there will be great tribulation period on this earth. Jesus then, at the end of that seven years, will come back to this earth and the he'll defeat the Antichrist. He'll defeat all of the false prophets, the beast system will all be thrown down and Jesus will set up his millennial kingdom for a thousand years. We as saints who have been in heaven these seven years at the marriage supper of the Lamb, the judgment seat of Christ, receiving our rewards for what we've done in his body, we'll come back with him and he will put an end to the Antichrist system. Now that's a, a general simplification 
of what's going to take place. Uh, let me say it again, and I'm going to say it different ways for you to get it. Signs of the end. Types and shadows of the terrible agonies of men, people, and nature that will be produced during the days of judgment, the great tribulation period. Now, what we're experiencing now is a type or a shadow. Jesus called it the beginning of sorrows. The sorrows that no man has ever seen or will experience, the sorrows that he's talking about here are going to be revealed and experienced during the great tribulation period. Not until then. What we're experiencing now with pestilences, earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, all these things, famines, you're going to be shocked at some of the things that the Bible says are pandemic, which means a global exposure to these pains, these uh, contractions, these birth pains. The church is going to be caught up prior to this great tribulation period when all of these terrible agonies come uh, on the people uh, that are alive at that time. What we're experiencing now are types and shadows. Let's go over to Revelation chapter 4, and let me read to you beginning with verse 1. Revelation 4, 1. John says, After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up here. I will show you things which must be hereafter. Hereafter what? Hereafter the church age. Let's take the King James Old English out of it and read it. I will show you things that must be here after the church age is over. I'm going to show you things that's going to take place on the earth after the rapture of the church, after the church is caught up to meet Jesus in the air. That's the first part, our first advent of the second coming of Christ. Second coming of Christ has two parts. The first part is the rapture of the church where the church is caught up to meet him in the air. He doesn't come to the earth. Nobody sees him. The second part of the second coming is when Jesus comes back on a white horse. We come with him. He touches down. Everybody sees him. You see the difference? And then he says, immediately I was in the spirit. So if you go on down and you read verse six, it says, and before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto a crystal. Now, this is representative of the church, the body of Christ, a perfect, like a sea, body of people, no flaws. This is like a sea of glass. This is the church singing a song, casting their crowns before the throne, saying, and it has to be the church because there's nobody else that's referenced here that will have crowns. There are, I think I taught on this one time, there are about seven crowns that are made known in the Bible. So these, uh, this sea of glass, this great glass of people is singing, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So all of this worship to the Lord Jesus by the church where does this take place? Where are we? Where is the church? Revelation 4, we are in heaven worshiping the Lord. We are in heaven receiving the Lord's Supper, the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're in heaven receiving the rewards for what we've done in His body while we were on this earth. Now, go over to Revelation 6. And John goes on. Remember, John was, uh, all this was revealed to John 
Uh, and the scripture in the beginning of Revelation says, I will show you things that have been, that are, and that shall be. So he's looking at past, present, and future. Uh, Revelation 6, 1. I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw and beheld a white horse. He that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. He went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. These are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And the power to take peace from the earth, and they that should kill one another, there was given uh, a sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third say, Come and see, I beheld a black horse. He that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, A measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And see that you are that you hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. I looked and behold a pale horse, and the name that sat on him was Death and Hell. Verse 9, the fifth seal, I saw the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. And uh, of verse 10, and they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, uh, true, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood? And verse 11, and white robes were given unto them uh, that was said unto them that they would rest for a little season. Verse 12, I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood. Now, all of these seals that we just read that are being poured out, I think I may have skipped one or two. All of the devastation, the death, the hell, it goes on to say that the people alive at this time, it's going to be so terrible, they're going to cry out for rocks to fall on them to kill them. That's during the Great Tribulation period. Now, there are some ministers, prophetic ministries, that think we're in that time now. They are misguided. They are misrepresenting the scriptures. Now, whether they're doing it in ignorance or for speculation's sake or to sell books, I don't know. I can't judge them. But their, their alarms are uh, misplaced. That's, it's not that time yet. That time comes when the seals are being poured out. And like I say, there are those that believe they're being poured out now. But they are not. What we're experiencing is the beginning of sorrows, types and shadows. But after the rapture of the church, and we've plainly seen that the church is in heaven after Revelation 4, we're worshiping the Lord. We're receiving the rewards for what we've done in His body. We're going to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're not going through the great tribulation period. I know there are those that believe we are. I know there are very well-educated and anointed men and women of God that think this rapture business is nonsense. I've heard them say it. That's dangerous. The Bible teaches that the church is raptured out, taken up. In Revelation 4, we're in heaven, worshiping the Lord. Then the great tribulation with all of these agonies on men, people, and nature, that will be produced during the days of judgment, the great tribulation period, where the measure of the judgment is poured out on the people. But note, after Revelation 4, 1 through 11, the church is in heaven. Now, the thing that you and I have to make sure of is that we're going to be in heaven during the great tribulation period. You say, well, Pastor Caldwell, how do I make sure of that? The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Have you ever done that? I'm not talking about church attendance. I'm not talking about church membership. I'm not talking about going to church. I'm not talking about singing in the choir. I'm talking about being born again. 
Have you ever done that? Have you ever been born again? And if you have a question as to whether you have or not, you haven't. Because if you're born again, you know it. If you're what they call backslidden, if you've uh, fallen away from what you once had uh, an experience with the Lord or a love for the Lord, if you've fallen away willfully, whatever the case may be, you can make sure that you're in heaven when the great tribulation period is going on. Just these birth pangs, the beginning of sorrows, types and shadows should want to wake you up and make you realize, hey, if you think this virus thing is bad, if you think the earthquakes and the wars and the rumors of wars, and if you think all of this is bad, wait till the church is taken out of here and wait till the great tribulation period. You, <laughs> you, you not only won't be able to find any toilet paper, you won't be able to find any toilets. I mean, it's going to be worse than you have ever imagined. Now, I'm not trying to scare you or fear, uh, cause you to fear, but I want you to know Jesus. I want you to be born again. I want you to pray with me right now. We're going to take a little side trip here, and, and I want you to stop what you're doing if you can. Stop what you're doing. Just close your eyes sincerely out of your heart. Uh, I want you to pray and say with your mouth. Just repeat it after me. Wherever you are, at home, a hospital, a hotel, just say, Jesus, say it like you mean it. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe God raised you from the dead. Come into my heart, Jesus. Save me now. Take away my sin nature. Give me your righteous nature. Save me, Jesus. Fill me with your spirit. Amen. Now, if you did that, if you said that, if you believed that in your heart, said it with your mouth, Jesus came in. The Holy Spirit came in. He forgave you. He cleansed you. He delivered you. He filled you. And I have a little booklet that I want to give you. It's free. My gift to you. God loves you. You need to know this. Jesus is coming back, and I want you to go with him. I want you to make heaven. I don't want you to be here during the Great Tribulation period. You can get this book free. Just call the number on your screen, 1-800-264-2525. Or you can download it on our website, vtntv.com. You can download it for free. So just call the number or go on the website, vtntv.com, or call 1-800-264-2525. Uh, and we'll send it to you. Now, right now, I want to uh, deal with the, uh, another part of Jesus's warning here. Let's go back to Matthew 24. And when we go back to Matthew 24, let's look at verse 7. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. And again, he talks about uh, this is the beginning of sorrows. Let's talk about the distress of nations. Um, we won't really know the facts and figures. All we, all we hear now is supposition, speculation about the virus. Uh, this many have it, this many don't, this many recovered, this many died, this many. Uh, we're going to hear about this for whew, years. And we really won't know the truth of everything until all the facts are in. We hear a lot of comments, et cetera. But let me give you a little history here. The, the distress of nations. Because Jesus said, you will hear of wars, rumors of wars, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be uh, pestilences, famines, earthquakes. You're going to be shocked at some of the things uh, that the Bible uh, talks about uh, that <laughs> are pandemic. First of all, let's look at the dramatic increase uh, in the world population. Uh, it's interesting to note that while the population experienced very little growth for centuries, it was during the 20th century when the population quadrupled from about 1.5 billion 
uh, to about 6 billion in 2000 and reached 7.5 billion in 2017. More people means potential for more increased pain and sorrow. There's more people. We see it magnified. We have instant communication. We have phones, iPads, computers. Uh, we have television. We have social media. All of the pain and suffering is magnified, amplified, because we have more people on planet Earth. Now, the specific signs that Jesus told us to look for, wars and rumors of wars, see that you not be troubled, these things must come to pass. Nation will rise against nation. Let me, let me just give you some statistics, uh, biblical scripture verses. Isaiah 19, 2, it talks about the Egyptians against Egyptians. They will fight everyone against his brother, everyone against his neighbor, his city against city, kingdom against kingdom. Um, World War I was one of the deadliest conflicts in our history with a number of casualties far surpassing uh, that of previous conflicts. Military and civilian casualties, depending on the source, were but a 16.5 million people died. About 20 million people were wounded. That's World War I, First World War. World War II, was the largest and bloodiest war in our history. The number of military and civilian deaths and casualties varied from about 55 million people total uh, to about 72 million total to about 85 million total. Now, the 20th century was totally dominated by wars and conflicts. I, I, was, I was a child during World War II then when I was in junior high or high school, uh, my science teacher, Mr. Goss, he'd served in World War II. So had my father. He was, he was recalled for Korea. So uh, World War II, Korea, then Vietnam. Then I was in the Navy during that time and the Guantanamo Bay incident. And then we experienced Y2K, 9-11. I mean, several pandemics. All of these things are part of nation against nation. Now, I'm going to continue this tomorrow, the beginning of sorrows. Don't miss tomorrow's program. VTN is on Roku. If you have Roku, search VTN in the channel store. Add us to your lineup. And remember, Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and where you're watching too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221, or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN, your Arkansas Christian Connection, and follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at happy underscore Caldwell. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at vtntv.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at vtntv.com.